it is almost uh, an essential that the power structure has to change. You know, hashtag Me Too is extremely good at pointing us to that. But actually, when still there are so few female directors and producers in Hollywood, when there are still so few of those female directors who get recognition, um, until that's happened, then um, things w won't change as quickly as most of us would like. Welcome. Uh, I'm Brian Schmidt. I'm a cosmologist who grew up in the sticks of Montana and Alaska. I'm also the vice chancellor of the Australian National University. And today it is my honor to have a conversation on the history of feminism in the West with Dame Mary Beard, professor of classics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, she is a regular on British television, which is exported, as I can oh, attest yes. to. Uh, if you like reading an interesting blog, read her blog, A Dawn's Life. Uh, she is described, perhaps in keeping with today's topic, by the New Yorker as learned but accessible, uh, which seemed to be a uh, slightly uh, interesting way of describing it, but often described as the world's most famous classicist, which I would say at some levels also may be damning with faint praise. <laughs> That's uh, what my husband says. <laughs> to me, I guess I would say she's more than that. Uh, a true public intellectual, perhaps one of the few uh, remaining members of the species here in 2020, where we see public intellectualism, I would say, uh, fading from view, replaced by uh, Instagram uh, celebrities. It is an absolute honor, therefore, for me to be here and uh, have a chat with you today. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit about how women have been portrayed in the past. Uh, so in your book, Women in Power, which I encourage you to, to read, it's very accessible. Uh, it's nice and uh, short, uh, uh, but uh, packs a punch <laughs> Thanks, on, every, uh, on every page. Uh, you've explored how women are uh, depicted through the ages. So let's just go back to the beginning. Let's go back to Homer. Let's go back to the Odyssey. And uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit, maybe just from the very beginning of the Odyssey, and how Penelope is treated yeah, right at the beginning. Uh, th thanks, Brian. It's great to be here. Um, I think what this book tries to do, uh, and I'll come to the Odyssey in half a tick, is to, to set... Um, some of the issues that women still feel about exclusion and silencing, and you know, it's not only women, but I'm taking this from a female perspective, set that in a historical context. And you know, I'm a classicist and a, a rather old fashioned classicist in many ways, and I've read Homer's Odyssey since I was a teenager. And uh, there was one passage that I must have read 10 or 15 times, but only noticed about 10 years ago, which is, is the beginning of the Odyssey. And the story of the Odyssey, as I'm sure most of you know, is um, the hero Odysseus is coming home from the Trojan War, trying to get back. They've been victorious, trying to get back to his home in Ithaca. He's taking a very, very long time, partly because all sorts of natural disasters are occurring, but he spends an awful lot of time sleeping with women he shouldn't sleep with, sort of on the way, so years sometimes. Um, and meanwhile, at home, his wife Penelope is waiting for him with their son Telemachus, who is growing up. He's a kid when Odysseus leaves, and he is in his 20s when he comes back. And we think of the story of the Odyssey as a story of Odysseus's return, which it is, but it's also the story of the sun growing up. And book one, Penelope, um, is upstairs doing her weaving, and she decides to go downstairs into the public quarters of the house, uh, and there's a bard um, strumming on his whatever, and saying and singing very sad songs about what a crap time the heroes of Greece are having trying to get back home. Uh, and Penelope quite reasonably says, couldn't you sing something just a little more cheerful, you know, please? <laughs> At that point, Telemachus, who is now, I like to think of as a slightly kind of weedy, gangly, but probably 16-year-old or something, comes up and says, mother, shut up. 
speech is man's business, go back upstairs. And Penelope goes back upstairs. Now, I, how I managed to read that for about 30 years of my adult life and never notice it, I don't know. But once you have noticed it, you say, right, here we are, guys. We're at the very beginning of Western literature. Um, and you know, what's happening to a woman? She's been told to shut up. And even more, her son is learning to be a grown-up man by shutting his mum up. That's, and it's not just that he's being a kind of you know, an awkward teenager. He is doing what he should do. And there is no bit of the history, uh, I will say confidently, of the history of the West, but I think it goes a lot further than that. There's no bit of the history of the West in which that scenario has not been replayed ever since. And one thing you can do, you go to any group of women, um, you know, of all kinds of different politics, of different versions of feminism, uh, you know, different ethnicities, any group of women, and you say, is there ever an occasion in which you felt that you could not make your point at a <coughs> meeting because the men were not listening to you? And I can guarantee, uh, I, or that be proved wrong, of course, but I can pretty well <laughs> guarantee there's not a woman on the planet who doesn't know what that feels like. There are all kinds of other uh, factors involved. There is, there is race and there's class and there's privilege of all kinds of other ways. But actually, when it comes down to it, the history of the world is a history of men not listening to women. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. <laughs> 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 They don't, I mean, the world could do to listen to a lot of other people, I have to say, but they certainly should start by listening to women. Uh, hard for me to argue as uh, <laughs> someone who watches within a university, uh, conversations occur and being gobsmacked sometimes by how they play out. Uh, so that is a particular case of Penelope because she is portrayed, I guess, from my memory of reading that when I was young, as what I would describe as a very, I had a very strong mother, so I've been kind of indoctrinated in uh, some form of feminism, even if it wasn't particularly described that in my youth. Uh, and to me, she was just a very weak character, Penelope. Penelope. Penelope's really savvy. You know, Penelope, you know, she's the one, she knows she should tell the bard to shut up, and she's the one, because she's got all those blokes crying crowding into the palace. Odysseus is still coming back. They all think, right, okay, I want to marry that woman because then I will be, you know, king of this outfit. And what does Penelope do every night? Well, she says to them, okay, um, you can um, marry me when I finish my piece of weaving, right? <laughs> and every day she weaves and every night she pulls it out. And so she never finishes the piece of weaving. Now that, you know, now you can say, as many an ancient Greek would have, you know, there's female wiles for you. You can't ever trust a woman, can you? You know, she never does what she's going to say. <laughs> um, but, you know, in a sense, uh, Penelope, okay, there is one image of her as the, as the perfect faithful wife who is waiting for Odysseus to come back home. But she's damn smart, you know? And what I think is extraordinary is that even the damn smart, middle-aged, savvy woman who's been rearing this monster, Telemachus, I mean, she gets monstered by him and, uh, and does what he says, you know? Yeah. And I guess as it is interesting from my male perspective, I guess I see that as perhaps a woman not empowered, but what you're telling me is she actually was empowered within the confines of society yeah. of the day. Yeah, she's, you know, she's fighting it. She's yeah. fighting it unsuccessfully. And, you know, and I think you can say, look, you know, this is almost 3,000 years ago. It doesn't matter hill of beans, does it? You know, whether you know, Penelope's told to shut up or not. But actually, within the context of, first of all, classical, but then European and more wide culture more generally, she, that scene has never ceased 
to be replayed. And that's, you know, if it was just a one-off bit of aberrance, uh, you know, at the beginning of a, a very old work of Western literature, you know, who cares? But it's actually that you see there, in a nutshell, what has happened ever since. So let's talk about some of the works uh, back in this time where women seemingly are empowered or have power, uh, but it's always done in a very uh, simple way. So you can choose whichever one you want, uh, but uh, since we're talking, I guess, if we look at Agamemnon, for example, uh, in this same story of, of, of the, the war, what, how, how, are, how is strength uh, in yeah. female uh, portrayed? I mean, I think ancient Greece has been a, a, very it's a very interesting lens through which to look at this. And it's partly an interesting lens because there are, at first sight, a number of powerful women. In the, I'm not talking about daily life. I'm meaning the mythological stories, the literary, um, uh, the literary uh, uh, fictions, really, of ancient Greece. And, you know, one of the things that kind of attracted me to it um, as, as a subject to study, you know, because you know, if, if you're a, a sort of feisty feminist teenager, you don't like studying, you know, a society which is, you know, simply a load of patriarchy and sexism from top to bottom. You get, you do get entranced, and there is something complicated about this. You get entranced by the powerful women who take control. You know, Medea, um, who's deserted by Jason. You know, saying that you know, I'd rather stand in the battle line ten times than give birth to a baby once. You know, who do you think you're brave, oh guys? Um, and so there is a very strong rhetoric there of women, fictional women only, fictional women speaking out. Now, what I think you come to see later, you know, happily I didn't come to see it until after I felt more confident about my own relationship to this subject, is what happens to powerful women in Greek fiction? Something bad, you know? You know the idea, you know, there is Clytemnestra, you know, the wife of Agamemnon, who, you know, who kills the bastard, actually, when yeah. he comes back um, from the Trojan War. He's, he's slaughtered their daughter um, uh, in order to get good omens from the gods, in order to sail to Troy. Uh, she's taken a lover, and she kills him. Um, but every moment that you see male, female power in the ancient world, you know that you can write the end of the story. This is going to go, female power always goes to the bad, right? Yeah. And that's, uh, and there is not a single example, I'm prepared to pledge this, where female power works well. You know, women are in Greek fictionalized mythology are there to show that women are incapable of ruling. Right? That's, so the myth of matriarchy that we often think about, you know, oh, look, look back in those early Greek myths and you see powerful women. No, you don't. You see a justification for the rule of men because women can never be trusted to rule. Look at the Amazons, you know, the warrior women race. What happens to the Amazons? They get slaughtered. What about someone like Antigone, who strikes me as being maybe? Well, she doesn't have a happy ending, no, does she? Uh, you, no. know? you know, there is. A, well, she had her dignity. I mean, I think men have always said that about Antigone. Oh, she had her dignity, you know. But, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I think. Look, I, I'm I'm oversimplifying and overcrudifying it because if if the nuances of Greek literature was quite as simple and straightforward as I'm saying, I think it's pretty much that, but if it was quite as simple, you know, it would be a, a, a pretty unsophisticated thing to be reading. And I think that one of the, uh, one of the challenges of Greek literature, it's apart from the poetry of Sappho, everything that survives is written by men. Yeah. Part of the challenge of Greek literature is that some of these male playwrights can actually ventriloquize a version of, of women's complaints. 
So they build into these plays, although the end is always the same. They, they can construct an image of gender wars um, in, in a way that I think does engage you. So, you know, I, I would not like you to think that, you know, people like Euripides or Sophocles are not worth reading because the women always die in the end, though that's broadly speaking true. Um, they are actually on the way to that. They are problematizing it. They are saying, so what might the woman's voice sound like here? So go to Rome and the, the poet of it, um, you know, who's as nasty a piece of work as you could want, I think. But he writes a series of poems in which he imagines what the abandoned women of, the, of classical mythology would say to the men who abandoned them. Now, in the end, you know, we're not going to elevate Ovid to be a pioneer of any sort of modern feminism. But what I think is interesting is that Ovid can, can at least play with that idea, can say, what would it be like? to be on the other side of this. And you, you find you know, other aspects of, uh, of kind of interesting attempts to think outside the box. You know, there's a, a famous little bit of Greek mythology, um, which is the question of, do men or women enjoy sex more? Um, and uh, the, there's only one person who can answer this question. And it's the prophet Tiresias, who in the gender fluidity of the ancient world, which is something in a sense I think we're seeing again, in the gender fluidity of the ancient world, Tiresias has spent several years as a woman. So you have the male prophet who has been female. Um, but of course, what Tiresias comes out with is the idea of it's women have the best time in sex. Playing into another kind of ancient conceit which is, you know, the poor phallic patriarchal man is always outsmarted by the woman. Now, you know, how many times have we heard that? So, uh, the, so let, let's, so I, I'm actually curious because uh, at one point I read the complete works of Sappho, which if you've done so, you'll realize it's actually not a huge accomplishment because it's not <laughs> much. Uh, Sappho was apparently revered as uh, a very, uh, capable poet of her time, but how was she portrayed back then? Uh, I mean, as near as I can tell, they ag again had a way to diminish her. Yeah, she, she ends up throwing herself yep. off a cliff. Yep. You know, there's you know, uh, yet another example of the creative, uh, in this case, powerful with her words, Sappho, uh, ends up committing suicide in love for a man. You know, so you have the lesbian poet Yep. of antiquity, lesbian both in the sense that she um, comes from the island of Lesbos and giving her word to our sense of the word lesbian. Yep. How does it, how does this, and you know, they called her the 10th muse, you know, brilliant poetry, but she always, they have to be got rid of. So she falls in love with this fine character and, and throws a, and commits suicide. And so I think that I mean, I don't want to, as I say, I don't want to crudify this because the, the end of the story is always the same, but the way you get there is not always the same. And the, um, I think like quite a lot of, I, mean, I think yeah, this is going to sound very, um, I don't mean it to sound conservative, but I think that some of the people in the world who see the, uh, the ambivalences and the difficulties of oppression most are not, well, they're not only the oppressed, they're sometimes the oppressors. That, you know, I, I have a, a benevolent enough view of human nature that I, that I, I think that, uh, that, it is, that it is actually morally and emotionally hard to oppress another class. And you have to go to enormous intellectual lengths to justify that to yourself. And we, we've seen that, you know, we've seen that all over the world. It's, it's, it's tough. Um, and I think that um, you know, ancient Greece and Rome in some ways, in terms of um, gen the gender politics, ancient Greece and Rome have, have bequeathed to us some quite complicated ways 
in which um, men justify this, the oppression and suppression of women. So did women ever get the last word? And so I'm thinking of uh, Fulvia, and, and that's covered in your book. Uh, it strikes me that she, didn't she get the last word in, sort of one way or uh, another? We can uh, talk about what uh, that. Um, there's a, a, a very nasty story about um, the wife of Mark Antony, who in the middle of Roman civil wars um, gets, gets to see the head of her enemy, Cicero, displayed in the Roman Forum. They decapitated him and they put the head up in the Roman Forum in the, in the middle of a very nasty civil war. Um, the story is that Fulvia takes a pin out of her hair and she pierces the tongue of the head. The tongue which Cicero, whose head it was, had given some of the most devastatingly hostile speeches against her husband. Um, it, that's a scene that has been very um, popular with later painters who've, who've kind of done things like imagine Fulvia doing, taking the head home, putting it on her bed and doing it. No, rather, well, in a very erotic uh, yeah, pose. Hugely, which is kind, of, kind of, you know, really. A weird. And, um, you know, I, I think that, look, the, the point, uh, we can spin that story yep. and we can turn it, turn it on its head, sorry, and... Uh, think that this is righteous female revenge. It's not, you know, when it's told by ancient writers, this is an example of true horror. Yeah. This is the woman who is doing precisely what you fear women might not be able to do. You know, she is not respecting the head of the dead. You know, and you know, she has a very nasty record of doing all those, those things that women are supposed to do, like, um, you know, seduce innocent poets, and um, um, uh, she's uh, uh, transgressively involve herself in military activity. She ends up in the, the civil war does, as wars often do, in a sense, kind of shake a bit of Roman certainties about gender. Um, but it's very interesting that um, uh, it. Fulvia is involved in a siege, a siege at the town of Perugia, modern town of Perugia. She's inside, and it's one of the most vivid um, glimpses we get of ancient army culture, because what has survived from the town of Perugia is the sling bolts that go backwards and forwards, each with a, a, basically a message on, you know, saying, oh, you know, up yours, Octavian, and this kind of thing. You know, in the way that we're told, I don't know if it's true, that, that, uh, that soldiers in the Second World War wrote messages onto the bombs they dropped, really to, you know, in a sense, a rather crude version of sexual power over the enemy. Well, people sometimes, students sometimes ask, you know, when we're talking about female um, uh, anatomy, uh, in the ancient world, uh, you know, when, when, do, when do we first know the words for things like clitoris? Well, fascinatingly, um, the first use of the word clitoris known in Latin is on one of these sling bullets, yeah. which is aimed at Fulvia, and it says on it, this bullet is going for Fulvia's clitoris. Now, if you start to think that Fulvia... You know, was you know someone who had kind of great respect and was an upstanding you know moral lady who kind of claimed some authority in ancient Rome. You know, think of the think of the squaddies on the other side saying, "This is going for Fulvia's clitoris." Okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. I mean, uh, help, sorry. The, the ancient literature is like this, you know. So uh, when we uh, go through and think about uh, how things maybe haven't changed as much as we'd like them to. One of the things that you said uh, that struck me is one of the most obvious things to come out was the way that women were repeatedly used as explanatory tools for otherwise unexplained events. So they were used as sort of that yeah. way, and you yeah. talked a little bit about yeah. how uh, perhaps uh, that same prop is being used against yeah. certain members of the royal family. Yeah, right I mean, it's absolutely standard in Roman culture and also in later court culture uh, uh, where you've got one man rule and a palace uh, in trying to explain 
the sometimes odd and inexplicable um, events that happen behind the palace walls that you can't see, you say, oh, it's the, it's the woman, it's the empress. So you, I mean, many of you, I'm sure, have read Robert Graves' I, Claudius, you know, where um, Livia manages the wife of the emperor. You know, we're told she poisons anybody she doesn't happen to like. So any unexplained death is the poisoning by this Machiavellian character. And I think it always comes as quite a shock to people to say, you know, look, she might have been quite a nice sort of homely character. All this might be fiction and projection. But when that hits home is when it comes out in um, something, you know, the British royal family has been having a bit of a, um, a, a, a rocky time lately in more ways than one. Um, but I was very struck in all the stories about Harry and Meghan, how you had... And I think, interestingly, the female of the royal family, the mixed-race female, you know, why is it that our smiley, ginger-haired prince is wanting to leave his royal duty and go to Canada? It's Meghan Markle. Now, we have absolutely no idea whatsoever what has gone on between Harry and Meghan, and there is no way we're ever going to get it. Um, but we, we are... Our press, at least, is absolutely convinced that somehow the explanatory tool here is, is the female interloper. And that, that happens really commonly throughout um, politics, in, a, in, in the secrecy of politics. I mean, I remember when I was quite young how Nancy Reagan was always used to explain why Ron was doing something very stupid, as if Ron could, wasn't capable of doing something very stupid by himself. Um, and in the UK, Sherry Blair copped it um, when Tony did things that we didn't want. No, that did stop, eventually, when Tony did things that we really, really didn't want, and it became implausible that it was Sherry. But there's, there's that sense that, you know, it's a kind of chercher la femme in order to blame, you know? You want to be able to blame the woman. So another thing that uh, you've talked a lot about is uh, essentially women seizing power through the Me Too movement. And I guess I'm kind of struck by, uh, well... Seizing power, I think, is putting well, it there is, well, I would go, say it's no, a way of asserting and go, saying go on, right. we are going to yes. drive no, the agenda. Yes. I think seizing power would just be a bit beyond what I would say, but go on. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. But if you think of women in the Aristophanes uh, comedy and Lysistrata trying to seize power uh, by withholding sex, uh, so do you think the Me Too movement is going to keep going? Or do you think it's going to end up being sort of dismembered by traditional institutions reasserting their power? Um, I'd like to think that Me Too was the start of a big change. Yeah. I'd like to think that, and I'm, I hope that's the case. I mean, I think the difficulty here is that is in the process between being a hashtag and actually being getting something done. Now, we don't know what's going to happen with Harvey Weinstein, you know, and I, we could all put, you know, I think my money would probably be on that he will in some way get off. Um, does that mean that the Me Too movement was a futile gesture? No, it doesn't. Um, I, I think that things, certainly in that business, will never go quite back to what they were before. So, uh, but whether more widely, hashtag Me Too, will become a, 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 a way of women, you know, asserting and claiming power. I, I don't know, and I partly don't know because. I think that if your analysis is necessarily <coughs> that why is it possible for those things to happen, well, that actually has to be because of the power structure of, in this case, we're talking about the movie business, but it could be anything else. And if you, it follows, I think, that if you want those things not to happen, it is almost a, an essential that the power structure has to change. You know, hashtag MeToo is extremely good at pointing us to that. 
But actually, when still there are so few female directors and producers in Hollywood, when there are still so few of those female directors who get recognition, um, until that happens, then um, things w won't change as quickly as most of us would like. So, yeah, there's an interesting question about, uh, I guess, how we do bring equality. Uh, before we get to that, because we're going to have to wrap up here pretty quick, one of the things that struck me, I was saying, okay, so we've talked about the Western world, and I just yeah. quickly went by one of my colleagues here suggested, let's say, what are the top women of classical China? And yeah. it turns out they can be broken into sort of two bits, <coughs> beautiful and evil yeah. power yeah. mongers, so yeah. very similar. So yeah. Yeah. are we dealing with not just what I would say a societal construction, or are we dealing with just a flawed design of the human species <laughs> yes, here? No. Um, we're dealing with a societal construction, but we're dealing with a societal construction that I believe repeats itself yep. um, over the planet. Uh, and I think it's always very, you know, it's <laughs> difficult to talk about uh, cultures in which you have not grown up and internalized their norms, but I've done the same as you. I've asked and, and read, and it seems to me that we've got something which is fairly universal. I think, for me, the fact that it's universal doesn't mean it's natural. And you know, the way kind of I feel that my generation of women was always put down and put back in our box, and it's done in the ancient world and in almost any other historical society, was that it is not natural for you to be doing what you're doing. Now, you know, n the trouble about nature is that nature is a societal construction. And, uh, you know, we can change it, you know. Nature is a kind of shorthand for, for what we think always happens. So I'm always trying to figure out how to, to fix things, and this will be the last thing that we, uh, I guess, discuss. Uh, what, uh, how, do we, how do we get equality? There are differences between men and women at some level. The challenge is, is that uh, whenever you have some sort of separation, then I would always say that it would seem that separate is never equal. But I guess I'm struck by the fact that you are in Newnham College, <laughs> which is an all-woman. Yes. So, I mean, is that the solution, where you need to have some freedom from men um, to survive, or was it just an accident? I, um, I, I don't think, if I was inventing Edu the educational system all over again, I don't think I would start by segregating it by sex. Um, I think that currently in Cambridge, a women's college is extremely useful in terms of the historical development of a university, which was all blokes for 650 years. Um, you know, so everything around you is like being in a blokish, yep. white blokish world. Actually, yep. all the pictures on the walls, the chairs are all made for men. You know, everything. The lavatories are always better for the men. You know, everything is a male. It's, it's done for men. Um, so I think having a kind of college that can act as a ginger group is is a good idea. Um, I don't think it. I don't think it solves. I don't. I, you know, I wouldn't say that that's the solution. And, and you know, I, I think the solution is a long struggle in changing how we think about ourselves mm -hmm. in our heads. And that I think is, um, uh, that's, you know, I'm not going to live to see that. You know, but I'll just give you one <laughs> example of, of you know how we're all implicated in this sense that women are not. You know, women are not in positions of power. If you say to an audience like this, and I say to myself, close your eyes and think of a, a, a professor. Just think of a professor. What almost everybody will see is a m relatively elderly male, white, in a white coat. That would be a scientist. I see that image. And I am a bloody professor. You know, so when your own imagination doesn't see you, yep. even though that's what you are, that I think is, a, is an indication of the sort of gap that there is between um, us and equality. Well, it is a gap which I think we're on a very slow march to fix, <laughs> but I think we'll finish on that. And uh, let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you.